Good afternoon and welcome to the American Plural Endowment Grow Pro webinar series. I'm your moderator, Melissa Muñoz. I'm a member of the AFA Young Professional Council and a North Carolina State University postdoctoral res post research scholar at the Mountain Horticultural Crop Research and Extension Center. I have a master's and a PhD in plant and environmental sciences from Clemson University both working with Botrytis blight management in cut flower. Today's session is on controlling white fly on poinsettia. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be part of the AFE Grow Pro webinar series, which features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to the general support of AFE sponsors. This session is sponsored by Embu, Sunmite, SC, Cipro, and Syngenta. Embu was founded on 2022 as a company built on a half century of environmental science experience for the sole purpose of advancing healthy environments for everyone and everywhere. Sunmite, SC, is a novel liquid formulation providing enhanced efficacy and easy use. It controls a broad spectrum of pets, including mites, aphids, white flies, and leafhoppers. CPRO is dedicated to discovering and developing sustainable solutions. Their mission is to provide plant protection and plant management products and services that feed specialized market needs. Syngenta is a leading science-based ag tech company. They help millions of farmers around the world to grow safe and nutritious food while taking care of the planet. If you would like to learn more about our sponsors, if you're a supplier and are in interested in becoming a sponsor for your topic, you can find that information and more about the webinar series on AFE's website at endowment.org slash GoPro, and you will also find it in the chat. Today's session will be presented by Dr. JC Chung. After the presentation, we will open up the discussion for questions uh, session. So feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature or in the chat at any time. We will answer as many questions as we can before the end of the hour and any unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being recorded and will be shared to AFE's YouTube account. Through the YouTube's accessibility features, you can access closed caption in other languages. To get us started, I would like to share a bit about today's expert speaker. Dr. JC Chunk is a technical development manager at CPRO with over 15 years in the turf and ornamental industry. He is leading the company's ornamental R&D program, delivering innovative solutions to complex pro problems. His extensive academic career includes a bachelor's degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Arizona graduate training at the University of Georgia, postdoctoral training at the University of Florida, and professorship at Clemson University. In his current role at CPRO, he's fostering innovation and enhancing ornamental education with a commitment to supporting growers in delivering the highest quality plants. Dr. Chong, welcome and thank you for presenting today on controlling white fly on poinsettia. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, thank you for everybody for joining us today uh, for this session on controlling white flies on poinsettia. Again, I'm uh, JC Chong of uh, CPRO, uh, previously of uh, Clemson University. So um, hopefully uh, everybody attending this session is uh, growing poinsettia. Uh, if you don't, thank you for coming. Um, but uh, where are you as far as your crop is concerned? Are you still propagating? Are you starting to grow them? Does any of them starting to uh, starting to show color on the bracts? Um, it's too early 
uh, for harvest uh, for uh, shipping yet. So probably not the last stage over there. Now today, what I'm going to talk about, um, because propagation is already a process that's much further um, back, uh, we already done that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about white fly management on propagation. What I'm going to spend a little bit more time on is actually propagate uh, uh, white fly management on the growing and the finishing uh, stage. So we'll focus on those. Um, so for those of you that actually wants to learn more about uh, pests and disease management during propagation, uh, I have published a uh, article uh, in uh, Greenhouse Management Magazine in the August issue of Greenhouse Management Magazine, where I go into a little bit more details about how you can manage your pests and diseases uh, during propagation. So uh, check out the article called uh, The Poinsettia Playbook. Um, here's the link if you want to get a, a copy of that article. Just go online, and get it. So as far as uh, pests that we're dealing with during growing and finishing stage of, point, of, of a poinsettia crop, we have quite a few of insects and mites. Uh, one of the most common one really is a uh, fungus net. So hopefully you've done enough in the propagation stage that your fungus net, fungus net uh, problem is a little bit low, but do understand that they will uh, kind of show up. So the adults are these little tiny nets that kind of dance around on the uh, medium surface, but it is the uh, larvae that's going to cause a little bit more problem because they will damage root when the, uh, when the uh, population is pretty high. Shorefly is another pest that we see pretty often. Um, we don't see the larvae that often, but you know the adults are pretty obvious because they're about the size of a... Uh, fruit fly and fly around and can be kind of annoying. Um, but again, uh, hopefully during propagation, you have to take care of a lot of that show fly problem along with your fungus net problem that you don't have to deal with it too much in the growing and finishing stage. Um, white flies um, is gonna be more of a concern as you go into the growing and finishing stage. Uh, you're gonna see more and more of those white fly problem as well. Same thing with Lewis mite. Uh, Lewis mite uh, is one of those spider mite species that can cause a lot of stipplings on your flowers, so, I mean, on your on your leaves. So be careful with that. Uh, broad mite, we typically see them a little bit earlier in the growing stage. Uh, what they would do is that they'll cause that distortion and gnarly growth on the uh, tip. Um, so. Uh, Take a look here. Take a very close look at the uh, distorted tissue and see whether you can find broad mites or not. Or not. And one way to identify broad mite pretty easily is to look at the eggs. The eggs to me look like football. You can see on that picture in the middle there, where the eggs are going to have those white pimples or white dots on it. So it's pretty easy to identify a broad mite. Thrips, I mean, the uh, mealybugs, excuse me, mealybugs, we're seeing more of those popping up. Definitely, we're seeing citrus mealybugs, we're seeing Madeira mealybugs, and I'm seeing more and more striped mealybugs as well. So mealybugs is a little bit further along uh, during the stage. They, they have a longer life stage. That's why it takes them a little bit longer to develop. But once they develop a population, it is pretty uh, disastrous. So you want to make sure that you keep an eye on those and treat them at the very, very beginning. And thrips, again, uh, we've seen them quite a bit throughout the production cycle, uh, more damaging on the growing tips because what they'll do is they're going to cause that uh, stipplings and distortion on the tip. Uh, Western flower thrips will cause problems, but also echinothrips can be a big problem on uh, poinsettia as well. So those are some of the major insects and pests, uh, insect and mite pests that we deal with growing, doing growing and finishing stage. But what we're really talking about today, again, is uh, white flies. And that's really, when we grow poinsettia, that's one thing that we always have to worry about is uh, white flies, where they are, how they can cause, what kind of damage they can cause. So there are quite a few different species of white flies, but there's really three major species that we typically see in poinsettia production. I would say 95% of the time, or even 99% of the time, I'm seeing the sweet potato white flies, which is the those uh, white flies in the middle of the of the of the three pictures. And we'll sometimes we'll see the uh, the wing white flies, and sometimes we'll see the uh, greenhouse white fly, but predominantly is the uh, sweet potato white flies, or some people call it silver leaf white flies. So you can actually identify these three white fly species based on both adult 
and uh, pupil uh, characteristics. So for the adults, this is a very simple uh, decision tree, you can say, uh, to help you identify the three major white fly species. The first question you want to ask is, well, does a adult have any uh, zigzag patterns on the wings? If the answer is yes, then you have bent the wing white flies. If no, you ask yourself a second question. How do the uh, adult fold the wings? If they fold the wings like a tent, like a triangular tent, then you've got a sweet potato white flies. If they hold the wings kind of flat over the body, then you have a, a greenhouse white fly. Now the three white fly species can also be identified or distinguished on their pupil stage. So you ask is, you know, does the pupil or the shed skin has a sort of a vertical side, kind of straight up and down side? If the answer is no, the side looks like it's sloped, like a gumdrop, then you have sweet potato white flies. If you have uh, the straight side, then you ask yourself the second question. What does the hair on the top of the pupil look like? If they are long and kind of straight, then you have greenhouse white fly. If they are short and so kind of curly, then you have bent the wing white fly. So uh, pretty easy to identify what three, these three species are. But again, like I say, the predominant uh, species that we're dealing with is the uh, sweet potato white flies or the silver leaf white flies. And also predominantly we are dealing with the B biotype of this particular species. So biotype is basically a way for us to say, all right, this particular population has a little bit different in genetics. So they have a little bit of difference in biology. B biotype or the uh, Asian minor Middle East, in Middle Eastern uh, variety or the biotype is a predominant one, but we also have another biotype called the Q biotype or the Mediterranean biotype um, that you need to watch out for. Um, the, Q bio, the reason is the Q biotype is resistant to a lot of neonicotinoid and insect growth regulators. So if you build your management program, based on neonicotinoid and insect growth regulators, and you're dealing with Q biotype, more than likely your management uh, program is not gonna work. So you need to kind of figure out uh, what's wrong with it. And so, but there's no way to tell based on the uh, look of the adult or the pupa, whether you're dealing with a Q biotype or B biotype. The only way you can tell the two biotype is using genetic um, um, analysis. So, if you have a white fly population that cannot be controlled with neonicotinoid or insect growth regulators, if you suspect Q biotype, then you can you have to send the sample in for analysis, and you can contact Dr. Cindy McKenzie at USDA ARS. Um, here's her contact information. Email her first. Uh, say you know I might be suspecting this. Would you take a look at that? And more than likely, Dr. McKenzie will be happy to take a sample and run the analysis and let you know whether you are dealing with a bio biotype or a Q biotype. So you kind of need to know that information and uh, adopt your management program accordingly. So let's talk about management of uh, white flies on a poinsettia. Right? So what is the key so that you can be successful in managing them? What would I say is, so, you know, start early because if you grow a poinsettia, more than likely you are going to have white fly. If you know they are going to show up, let's figure out a way to deal with them before they even showed up. So uh, you need to start early. For one reason why you need to start early is because the white fly population can develop one generation in a very short period of time. Uh, in the South, we can have a generation within three weeks. And in the North, you may have six weeks, buy yourself a little bit of time. That really depends on the temperature. Uh, so a white fly population can actually build up very, very fast and it can caught you off guard. So don't let that happen. Uh, start early, knowing that the white fly population is going to grow fast. Uh, you want to be ready for them at any time. So the picture basically on the right hand side show you uh, basically a general life cycle of the uh, sweet potato white flies. You have the adult, then they lay eggs. Oftentimes the eggs are sort of lay in a semicircle pattern. So it's pretty hard, easy to see. And then you're going to have the pupae. Now, when it comes to the nymph and the pupae, you kind of want to make sure you understand whether they are alive or dead. If they are yellow and have red eye, well, that means they are pretty healthy. And if they look like translucent and they have a hole or a slit on the top, 
that means the uh, white flag adult already emerged. If you have a black or brown one, they're either dead or they're nice. So um, or the different color, different look of the names and pupae can tell you whether your management approach is uh, effective or not. Uh, to start early, also uh, need to you need to also understand that the uh, white fly population can come from both inside and outside. Uh, the outside source would include your cuttings. Um, as you know, despite their best effort, sometimes the propagator may not be able to completely subdue the uh, white fly population. So uh, you want to check the cuttings coming in, making sure that they are not infested with white flies. And in the South, where we where I am in South Carolina, and one thing that we often see is when um, the farmers around the greenhouse starting to defoliate cotton, that's when we see a lot of adult white flies starting to flow, fly into the greenhouse. And you need to understand what is going on around the greenhouse so that you know that the risk of the adult coming in. So be prepared for that. And another source is the inside source. What I mean by that is what other plants do you have in your greenhouse that's already infested are contribu contributing white flies to your poinsettia crop. Identify those plants, doesn't matter. Those are your grandma's favorite plant, just get rid of it. Um, manage the uh, population, just making sure that you don't have a huge starting population of white fly to begin with. And, you know, I say I'm not going to talk about I'm not talking going to talk about propagation, but I need to mention this to you, which is for next year when you're thinking about uh, starting a next preset crop, you really need to think about a uh, pre-planned cutting dip to start clean. Prevent and cutting dip is basically that when you get your cutting, whether they're or unrooted, and you dip them in a solution of one percent, uh, zero point one percent horticultural oil or a combination of 0.5% insecticide or so with a Bovella bassiana. And this particular cutting dip is pre very, very effective in killing off the uh, white fly names and eggs on the poinsettia cutting and give you a clean start. All right, so for as far as the Bovella bassiana is concerned, when I mention that, I mean either Botanica WP or Velifer. And in some of the work that I have done in the past, also show that Velifer by itself at the label rate is pretty effective as a pre-cutting dip for white fly management. So consider those uh, options. Um, of course, you know, uh, you want to make sure that you read the product label and making sure a cutting dip application is allowed in your state and what rate to use. And there's definitely benefit to cutting dip. If you look at that particular chart on the right hand side, it's going to show you that if you don't do any dipping and you only release parasitoid, you can suppress the white fly population, but not particularly great. It would do the job, not great. But if you just do dip and parasitoid, it is better than dip by itself or parasitoid by itself. So the one of the benefit of doing cutting dip is to enhance your biological control. That's pretty important. And the second uh, benefit of uh, doing pre-cutting dip is it would give, it would reduce your starting white fly population, meaning that you're buying yourself time up to about four or five or six weeks that you don't have to spray any insects like, or use biocontrol to suppress them. So, you know, there's cost saving in some way. If you do not have to spray very, very beginning, that's great. And as far as, uh, um, so when it comes to white fly management, one of the very key important component is monitoring. You want to use a sticky card really to monitor your adult white fly population. On your, on your transplant, put it right over the top on the canopy. So if the, uh, they're starting to have any sort of white fly population buildup, you can catch them a lot earlier. If you're starting to see a lot of white flies on your sticky card, make sure you take a look at the underside of the leaves and see how many of them are as well. Um, monitoring with uh, sticky card is very, very important, but you kind of have to do it right. Um, so I want to introduce you to two different resources that, uh, that will come out just in the past week or so that will give you a little bit more information on using sticky card. One of them is the uh, eGrow Alert <clears throat> that you can access online for free on how to use sticky card. 
And also uh, my newsletter, Pest Talks, that come out this week, just a few days ago, actually, uh, on, you know, which one is better, blue card or yellow card. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the resources that might help you uh, take a look at that. Let's talk about biocontrol of white flies. Um, I really do consider biocontrol of white flies to be a success story when it comes to biological control in greenhouses. Uh, we have started to use biological control since the 80s and it has been working wonderfully and a pretty good cost saving. So if you want uh, to learn more about biological control of white flies, I recommend that you go to this particular article um, from available for free from AFE uh, called Biological Control of White Flies in Poinsettia, What Works. And uh, that's a great article uh, from Dr. Rose and Sarah uh, in Ontario, where they share their research and their, uh, and their experience as far as uh, how to do bio control of white flies well. Um, in that particular article, they're also talking about, you know, the econo economy of uh, doing pesticide application and biological control. It's a very interesting uh, reading. Just take a look at that and see whether you agree with them or not. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a good thought provoking article, at least to me anyway. So as far as biological control agents of white flies, you have quite a few options. Uh, some of the most commonly used biological control options for white flies are Encarcia formosa uh, and Aromoceros. Uh, Encarcia and Aromoceros are actually parasitoid of uh, white flies. And often you can buy them single species or you can buy them both species combined in a single stick. Uh, that picture on the uh, left corner there are showing you some black pupae and some yellow pupae. In fact, the black pupae are the Encarcia pupae and the yellow pupae are the Aromoceros pupae. So they can be available uh, as a combined kit or combined uh, strip that you can put out in your greenhouse. And also you can use Ambrosia swirsky for controlling white flies. Of course, Ambrosia swirsky also are very effective against thrips. Uh, Delphasis catalini is a predatory beetles that you can use for white fly management. And lace wings, uh, some folks are using green lace wing. But by far, most people are using Encasia, Aromoceros, uh, Swirsky, and also Delphasis uh, for sure. One of the questions that I always get from folks uh, when I talk about biocontrol bio white fly, one of the more commonly question is, Okay, when do I want to start that program? When do I want to start releasing these biological control agents? Um, in my opinion, um, it really depends on whether you know what happened to the cuttings or not. Uh, if you know that the cutting have not been treated with any long residual broad spectrum insecticide, you can start releasing the biocontrol agents as soon as you're done with transplant or potting. You can do that almost immediately. And if you do cutting dip, uh, you can start soon after pot, or you can start four to eight weeks after the potting. Uh, I say four to eight weeks because if you remember that graph that I showed you earlier, if you just do dip, it kind of buy you time for four to six weeks thereabout. So during those early period, you may not need biocontrol to suppress the Wi-Fi. But after that period, you need to start releasing the white fly biocontrol agents. The most important thing you want to do here is really monitor your white fly population so that you can see when during that four to six weeks you need to start releasing biocontrol agents. Now, the last scenario would be that if you know your cutting has been treated with a long residual broad spectrum insecticide, or you don't know what the cutting has been treated with, um, the best the best approach may be to start about four weeks after pot, uh, potting. I'm saying that because um, just in case that long residual broad spectrum insecticide may have negative impact on the biocontrol agents that you release. So you want to give it time for the biocontrol uh, for the insecticide residue to break down. Four weeks is sort of a good general rule of thumb as far as when it comes to minimizing the uh, bark, the impact, the negative impact of insecticide on biocontrol agents. But again, uh, you want to make sure you monitor, keep an eye on your white fly population, 
if you really need to start cheating for white flies, you need to get started. And the second question that folks always ask me about biocontrol agents, a uh, biocontrol of a uh, white fly is, all right, so there's so many of them available, which one is the best? Well, um, there are operations that have got very good success with the parasitoid. So you can go with just one or both species of the parasitoid. You could do that. But from what I've seen in the past, uh, I would recommend a sort of a mixed species approach, uh, meaning that you would release the predatory mite, you would release the fastest, you also release the uh, parasitoid. Now, it sounds complicated, but I think that particular mixed species approach is going to give you the best efficacy because each one of those biocontrol agents are going to target a different life stage. And therefore, your entire life stage of the white fly, every single one of them, or except for the adult, are going to be killed and give you a much better control that way. So Embracer Sworsky, that one would feed on your eggs and young nymphs. And uh, Delphastus, which is that black beetle in that diagram, it would basically eat all life stages, but it would prefer the uh, eggs and also the young nymphs. Aromoceros, it will go after the young nymphs by parasitizing them. And Encasia, it will go after the young nymphs uh, to parasitize them, but they will also stink the old nymphs or the pupa and feed on the juice that's coming out from them. So they're actually killing the white flies at two different stages. So as you can see, if you use a different species um, to target different life stages, you probably will get a much better efficacy in control. But understand that uh, whenever you are doing a uh, biological control of a white fly, sometimes they may not get to um, suppressing the entire white fly population. So sometimes insecticide may still be needed to suppress your white fly population. So when you're actually using insecticide, then you need to think about what is the compatibility of your insecticide and your biological control agents. Now, that is a huge topic, and that is not a topic I want to go into details today, simply because there's just, there's so many considerations, there's so many information that you suggest. You need to know your pesticide, uh, you need to know your biocontrol agents, you need to know your crop, how do you apply them, when do you apply them, how much you apply them, and more importantly is what do you expect to see. So, oh, that's just way too complicated. I'm not, I won't be able to talk about it today. So hopefully in the future, we may have an opportunity to talk about that. So as far as compatibility, you can find the information uh, from the site effect database at Cobra or BioBest. Those are two spots that's very good to look for. Or really, I think the best information source is your biocontrol agent supplier and your insect site supplier as well. So talk to your supplier and see what they can uh, recommend and help you with that uh, in that uh, topic. All right, let's talk about insecticides. Um, <clears throat> I've done a lot of tests on insecticide for white fly management on Coincida. And here are the A team. I mean, I kind of borrowed that from a pathologist colleague. They always have the A team and the B team. Um, for me, I like the A teams uh, because that's what will give you the best uh, result. So uh, on the left hand side, you have the insecticide that can be used for drench and also for spray. Uh, spray. On the right hand side of the screen, you have the uh, insecticide that are available for spraying only. So that's a long list of insecticide. I'm not going to go down every single one of them. I'm just going to put it up there. So when you have a chance to review this presentation or the handout in the future, uh, you will have this available on your hand. So anyway, these are my A team. I've done a lot of research on them and I find them to be some of the most effective insecticide for white fly management. Um, and I want to do know, I want to notice that I also give the IRAC number in the parenthesis. We'll talk about insecticide rotation shortly. IRAC number is pretty important when it comes to that. Uh, so A are the neonicotinoid. So if you are growing poinsettia for 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 uh, for customers that do not want neonicotinoid, uh, you want to avoid those. Uh, and also I mark several of them with a red cross. Uh, on the top, and those are the insecticides that you want to avoid 
if you have a Q biotype, because they have been shown to be um, a little bit less, the Q biotypes to be a little bit less sensitive to this uh, insect site. Um, so in order not to continue that resistance, you want to stop using them or avoid using them uh, at all. So um, if you want to know more information, uh, I would recommend that you read one of my old articles uh, written by me and my postdoc at that time, Gun Gil, uh, called Warding Off White Flies uh, in the Grower Talks, May 2021 issues. And in there, we go into a little bit details about, you know, what are the effective insecticide, how to use them, so on and so forth, including uh, how to use a cutting tip. So uh, check it out. So if you are thinking about using uh, for white fly management, I would recommend, in fact, I say you must develop an insecticide rotation program. The reason being white fly is notorious for having great ability to develop insecticide resistance. So think about Q biotype. Q biotype is basically that one biotype that, that come into being because we overuse neonicotinoid and uh, insect growth regulators. So as we continue to use insect growth regulators and neonicotinoid, we are basically selecting for individuals that have the ability to withstand those insects that over time, they develop into something that's completely different from the original population or the Q biotype or the, or the, or the B biotype. And then you ended up having Q biotype. So um, we need to make sure that whenever we think about insecticide for white fly management, we need to rotate our insecticide. So here are my suggestions on how to build a rotation program. Uh, first, you want to make sure you want to rotate to an insecticide of different mode of action for each generation. So mode of action is basically the way insecticide kill an insect. And an easy way to understand mode of action is actually IRAC number. If you have an IRAC number that's different, that means it's a different mode of action. Okay, so uh, very easy to figure it out. Just pick up your label, take a look at the first page, and you say 4A, then it is a, a neonicotinoid. You don't have to remember neonicotinoid, but you can rotate from one number to another to another. So pretty easy to do. Uh, the second thing uh, what I would recommend is that if you are going to do more than one application per generation, you could use the same mode of action for the same generation, but you want to switch to a different mode of action for the next generation. So understand the biology of your pest and understand how long the generation time is for that particular species so that you know when you need to rotate to the next mode of action or IRAC number. And the th third recommendation that I would say is physical mode of action. Uh, what I mean by physical is the insecticide that would kill the insects, not through enzymatic reaction or not through biochemistry, not through ne uh, ne neuro ne neurotic toxicity. Um, what I mean is something that would suffocate them, that would dry them up or give them disease. So soap, oil, or pesticide are actually pretty good. Uh, you need to include one of these in your rotation program. And you can start with your program uh, with the most effective product and the application rate. Um, if you are going to drench, you do not want to follow a spray of the same mode of action. Otherwise, you're doubling up. If you are tank mixing, you want to make sure you mix different mode of action in the same tank. So those are some of the recommendations that I would have on how to build a rotation program. So if you want to find more information as far as how to build one, and specifically for white flies on Poinsettia, here's an old article from 2019, again, available from uh, AFE. Go to this particular uh, web address, click on it and then you bring right to that article. Uh, it's called Insecticide Rotation and Management of White Fly. Um, so take a look at that, and there may be some useful information for you on that. So let's think about some of the uh, potential rotation program that we may have, we may be able to build for White Fly. Now, these are some of the programs that I built. Um, that doesn't mean it is the only program that you can build, all right? So take a look at what you have on hand, what kind of insects that you have on hand, 
understand their mode of action or IRAC number, more than likely you'll be able to put a program that is right for you based on what they have. That you, it's going to be most effective for your situation. So all this uh, rotation program that I mentioned here is just going to be example, right? So uh, you can build your own, easy peasy. All right, so first look at the first scenario. Let's first look at this one. All right, let's do drench. All right, this is a, a scenario that a lot of folks are doing. They are going to drench first, and then whenever there's a infestation come out, they're going to spray for the hotspot. All right, so what can you do? Well, let's just say you are in an operation that you can use neonicotinoid. So you can start with Safari, drench it, and then later on, if you have hotspot, you can spray Rykar, and then Sandmai and Talus. You could do that. And if you want to do Kantos, you can drench it. And then you can just uh, follow it up with Rykar, Safari, or Mainspring. Or if you drench with Mainspring, that's a different way to do that. You can follow it up with Rykar, Safari, Semi. So again, like I say, this is this is just an example. You can put just about anything in there. Most important thing I want to demonstrate here is basically that if you drench it with a mode of action, when you spray it, do not use that same mode of action. Okay, so if you spray with Safari, which is uh, if you drench with Safari, which is 4A, whatever you spray later later on should not have 4A or 4 in there. Okay, make sure that's one point that you remember. The second thing, uh, let's just say you just want to spray, you don't want to drench at all. Well, you know, you can do Safari spray, followed by Rykar, followed by Contos, followed by Mainspring. You can do that. No problem. And there's a lot of way for you to, there's a lot of other product that you can incorporate in there. Um, as far as spraying, um, whatever program you develop, if you also do biological control, you want to understand that you need to use some of the product that can fit into your biological control program instead of um, product that typically not recommended. For example, Safari, uh, typically not recommend for biological control for spray directly. Uh, if you are an operation that doesn't want to use neonicotinoid, uh, that's fine. Just take out Safari and put something else in there, like Talus or Mainspring or Altus or, or not Talus, I'm sorry. Kantos, Altus, Mainspring, put one of those in there. Um, just use them uh, as a replacement for the neonic. Um, if you're starting to have BRAC initiating, you really want to make sure you read the labels carefully. Um, because not every insecticide or fungicide are safe for BRAC. You don't want to use those that's not safe for BRAC. For example, um, um, distance. Uh, distance is an uh, insect growth regulator that works very well against white flies when there's no BRAC. But you don't want to use it after BRAC formation simply because it is it will, it will probably cause phytotoxicity on the BRAC. Now, a lot of label are not going to say very specifically on whether to use it on point set or not. So you want to make sure you do a small scale test on them first. Get a small group of six to eight um, plants, spray with whatever you want to use, wait for about a week and see if there's any kind of damage and all. If there's any kind of damage, don't use it. If there's no damage, good, go for that. For anyway, um, there are some products that you can definitely use uh, uh, on point set after BRAC formation, Safari, Rykar, Kantos, Mainspring. You can put that together into a rotation program. Of course, you can re replace any of them with other products such as uh, Altus and Sandmite, Talus and uh, Tristar, so on. Uh, what if you want to spray before shipping? At that point, really, you don't want your client to see the uh, adults. So your goal is actually knocking down the adults. So in that case, uh, in some of the tests that I've done in the past, Rykar, Sandmite, and the combination of Avid and Tarstar actually works pretty good in knocking down the adults very quickly. So that's pretty good rotation right there. All right, hopefully, after incorporating what I'm talking about today, uh, you have a very, very successful beautiful poinsettia crop. And that's what we always want to see. Uh, so think about it, uh, take a look at the, after, after the presentation today. And uh, if you have more information, feel free to reach out to me um, for any kind of discussion at all. 
So, um, and I want to acknowledge Clemson University um, for supporting me in the past 16 years until I joined the uh, private industry. Uh, it has been a wonderful, very satisfying career uh, at the university. And all of that is really not possible without all the uh, technicians and postdoc and visiting scientists and students in my lab working in the past, as well as all the support from uh, uh, some of our industry partners as well. All right, before I stop, uh, I want to make sure that I um, remind everybody of the next GrowPro webinar on hydrobotic for uh, fluid culture production by Chris Curry. And that's going to be at, uh, September 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So again, register for that particular uh, uh, webinar. And I hope to see you guys at that point. All right, at this point, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Chong, for a wonderful presentation. Right now, I would like to open up for the Q&A session. And I see we already have a question. Uh, it's, you talk about white flight generation and change of mode of action. How long is a generation adult, sorry, egg to adult? So the uh, generation, it really depends on where you are, how warm is your greenhouse. Uh, in a typical Southern situation, what we are seeing is about three weeks. You can complete a generation egg to adult in about three weeks. And the females stay alive for a couple of weeks, lay eggs, and then they die. And in a cooler temperature, you you may they may take almost two weeks, I mean, two months to complete development. So it really depends on temperature. Right. Thank you. I see another question here from Sahad. He says, very informative and interesting talk by Professor JC. My question is whether Wi-Fi is capable of transmitting the viruses on poinsettia. So Wi-Fi is a great virus um, vector, but as far as we know, there's no virus that are transmitted by white flies on poinsettia. But in some of the crop, for example, some vegetable crop, especially those in the field, there's quite a few viruses that they transmit. So, but in greenhouse, that's not one of the big concerns. Um, you mentioned the whole rotation program and how important it is to rotate based on mode of action. Uh, but what is the application interval for the rotation programs that you mentioned? So the rotation program, I typically recommend, as I say, you would rotate from one mode of action to the mode next mode of action, depending on the generation time mm -hmm. of your pest. For example, mm -hmm. if you have a spider mite that takes just about one week to complete development, mm -hmm. you are going to end up having to, and you decide to spray once a week, then you know every time you spray, you need to change your different mode of action. But if you're dealing with something a little bit longer lasting, for example, white flies, which may take about three weeks to complete development, and you want to spray once a week, meaning that you can basically do three of the same mode of action before you switch it to another one. Got it. Thank you. Uh, and also, when relating to poinsettias, you mentioned how important it is to make sure that the products that you're apply, applying are safe for the black color. Uh, so, how long after a spray do I have to wait to see uh, if the insecticide has an effect or not? Right. I would, you know, you typically would see the uh, phytotoxicity on the brag within about three days or so. And that's basically mm -hmm. my experience. But I would say after you do a small test, you want to keep watching it for about a week or so just mm -hmm. to make sure nothing happened. Perfect. And I see another question here uh, from Javier. What is the accurate greenhouse temperature to ensure white fly population doesn't go over the limit? So the white flies can actually, um, they actually could withstand pretty high temperature. Uh, they are actually more of a subtropical species. So mm -hmm. the upper limit, you know, if you don't, if, if you don't, 
it might take almost up to 50 degrees uh, Celsius to really kill them. And that's very, oh. very high temperature. So mm -hmm. in most typical greenhouses that we never get to that point. So temperature control, try to use that to control white flies is probably not going to be very feasible. Uh, but do understand that the uh, the sweet potato white fly is a subtropical species, meaning that they are not going to be able to overwinter wherever you are very, very cold. So most of the population that we have when it comes to sweet potato white flies, they have to come from somewhere else. They have to first develop a population somewhere and then move into the greenhouse or they come into the greenhouse uh, through the cuttings. So getting clean cutting is going to be very, very important. And also monitoring when they come into the greenhouse is going to be very important. Thank you. Uh, we have another question here. What biopesticides are best for white fly? Okay, what biopesticides good for white flies? Well, uh, a couple of them really come to my mind that I have more experience with. One mm -hmm. of them is uh, Bovila basiana, and that could be Botanigar or Velifer, and also several other uh, trade names up there. Uh, but I have a little bit more experience with Velifer, and in my experience, very, very far has been pretty good at keeping white fly population down if you apply it consistently. And another, pop uh, another uh, good product is uh, Isaria which uh, we know as Ancora. Ancora also works very well when, in com when it comes to suppressing white fly population. And another question and comment, uh, it's from Elwood Roberts. He say, we no longer get an early freeze in the Northeast. Often we get a late surge of adults flying into the greenhouse in early October during field harvest. What is a good strategy for a late surge? All right. So, well, that is that is <laughs> that is a very tricky situation, and that's one of the biggest problem we have with thrips as well, which is you know population moving in from the outside. Um, I guess the best recommendation I can really give is just keep an eye um, you know you get to know your neighbor know what they are growing know when they're going to defoliate their uh, their cotton or any kind of crops or field harvest their vegetable get to know them know when they're going to do something and be prepared for all these white flies to start coming in um so once they come in, most of the uh, uh, chemical that I put in on A team, they should work very well against whatever white fly that's moving into your uh, greenhouse at that point. Uh, we have another question. It's, have you seen success with asadiractin as a biological insecticide? Uh, I have, well, somewhat of a mixed result when it comes to acid reacting. In some tests, it works very well. And in some tests, it, you know, it works kind of so-so. Um, so what I would say is acid reacting, uh, it, it is a viable option, but you want to make sure that you use it consistently. Uh, one of the benefits of acid reacting really is um, its compatibility with, uh, with a biological control. So it is something that you want to combine with your biocontrol and see if it's something uh, that you can get it going. Um, the key to acid reacting is, again, like I say, be consistent, um, have a very sustained program into suppressing that white fly population. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, what product do you recommend to control broad mite in poinsettias? All right, so the broad mite uh, option is, uh, there's not really that many options, to be honest. <laughs> so for broad mite, uh, what works for me is uh, this product. Uh, um, Pylon works very well against broad mite. Um, Akari, which is another miticide, it also works very well against broad mite. Um, Savat uh, works very well. Avid also uh, works pretty good. So those are four products that you can think about into uh, incorporating into your uh, management program for broad mites. And I'm pretty sure all these products actually are pretty safe for points later, uh, but you just need to check the label again. Perfect. Let's see. 
I think, uh, does anybody has any additional questions? We'll give it like a couple of seconds. If not, uh, there is one more question. Are there any biocontrol agents for broad mite? Well, you basically just answered that. <laughs> So I think with that, if there are not any further questions, there is one further question. He, Jorge asked, what do you think of using a kind of insect vacuum cleaner to capture adults? Mm, well, that is a very interesting um, thought. Um, I have not seen it being used very much in the U.S. greenhouses, but when I was working with cut flowers growers in Colombia, some of the operation actually use it uh, for sucking up thrips that were in the mums. Um, as far as how effective it is, I don't really know. Um, even if you just suck up the adult, you kind of have to keep going back and sucking up the adult because uh, the names are eventually going to, going to end up becoming adult anyway so it's probably not something that you want to do just one time or twice it's something that if you want to do you might have to keep doing it mm -hmm. uh, and more into broad mites uh, is asking if you know for predators for broad mites um i have to jog my memory on that uh i believe uh some of the predators and predatory mites would probably be a best option. Uh, Phytoceus andersoni is one of the uh, one of the species that has been used uh, against broad mite. So is uh, Swirsky. Swirsky has also been used against broad mite. Um, so those are two options there that you may uh, you may consider. Thank you, JC. And uh, yeah, some people were asking about this webinar series, this presentation in specific and the handouts, and you can find uh, the handouts and the links for everything that Dr. Chong mentioned before in the chat and the fully recorded webinar, along with any additional handouts will be posted in about one to two days in endowment.org slash grow pro, uh, and you will find it in the chat. With that, I think we can finish with this session. Thank you again, Dr. Chung. It was a great presentation and we have very interesting questions. And thank you all for joining us today for another session of the AFE Grow Pro webinar series. Please join us on September 19, as Dr. Chung mentioned, at 1 p.m. Eastern time for our next session on hydroponics for floriculture production. And again, please visit endowment.org slash growpro to see the full list of upcoming sessions. Past webinar recordings and other grower-related resources and research reports are available there, all of which uh, are available for free. And it's all thanks to the industry support. We also ask that you please complete the brief survey about today's session where you can find additional uh, comments and suggest additional topics and help us continue to improve with this seminar uh, series. Think, thank you again for joining us today and have a wonderful day. Bye everybody.